Welcome, if you will be opening in your scriptures to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. We want to say a, a welcome to those who are watching us online. Uh, we still have brothers and sisters that because of uh, health reasons and health concerns have not been able to come back into the assembly. Uh, we still love you. Uh, we're looking forward to the day when this is all uh, a bad memory. Uh, when we don't think about it anymore. We are uh, coming back to life as a congregation. Uh, Bible classes have begun, and that's one of the blessings of being here is that after worship, uh, we have Bible classes available all over the building, uh, several different teachers and subjects and uh, for our children, and uh, that is a, a great blessing that we missed during, during the pandemic. Uh, Wednesday night uh, services are continuing, and so things are happening. Uh, we've got uh, our first big uh, celebration next Sunday evening at 5 o'clock. We, we haven't had to ha been able to have congregational fellowships. And so God is uh, blessing us, and, and we are excited at the progress. We all came to Jesus uh, from different places. We, we were in different places spiritually uh, when we were attracted to Jesus. And, and He met us where we were and, and brought us to where He wanted us to be. Uh, he is an amazing Savior that way. 
This morning, I want to talk about three stories where Jesus uh, met folks, where they came to Jesus uh, and became followers of His, believers, and He worked in their lives. Three completely different paths, and yet they all came to Jesus. In Mark chapter 1, it starts out in verse 40. Now a leper came to Him, imploring Him, kneeling down to Him and saying to Him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. A leprosy is a, it's a terrible disease. It still exists in the world. Uh, I have preached at a, uh, at a congregation inside a leper colony where all of the members had leprosy. Uh, it is a treatable disease today with, with modern antibiotics. Uh, but in the first century, it was, a, it was a death sentence. It was a slow, painful, miserable, lonely death. From the moment the first spot appeared on the skin, uh, they're, they're outcast. They, they had to go outside the city. All of their clothes and furniture had to be burned. Their house had to be cleansed. They could not touch their children. They could not embrace their wives. They could not go into the temple. They were not allowed in the synagogue. They had to stay within shouting distance of anyone. And if anyone got within shouting distance, they had to cry, I'm a leper. Stay back. I'm a leper. And from the moment the first spot appeared on this man's skin, no one had touched him. Nobody shook hands with a leper. No, nobody, uh, no, nobody embraced a leper. It, it's still a little nerve-wracking. I, I remember the first man that I baptized who had leprosy. He gave his life to Christ and confessed Jesus and wanted to be baptized. And, you know, I always tell people, grab your wrist. Uh, and I, I grabbed them by the arms, and he didn't have any fingers. The leprosy had eaten his fingers off. Uh, and we baptized him into Christ, and his sins were washed away. The leprosy wasn't healed. He's still a leper. Uh, the man comes to Jesus with nothing. Th th this man came to Jesus completely broken and desperate and just saying, if you're willing, you can make me clean. I, I believe that you can fix this. And I don't have anything to offer. I, I, don't, I don't have any bargaining chips. I if you will, you, you can make me clean. And I've seen people come to Jesus like that, who were broken, uh, maybe struggling with an addiction that they had tried to overcome many times and failed. And their, their last hope was Jesus. Uh, the programs didn't work. Uh, the steps didn't work. The big book didn't help. And so they got to reading the real big book. Uh, and they, they came to Jesus broken and desperate with nothing and threw themselves on His mercy and said, If you will, you, you can fix this. You can make me whole. And Jesus stretched out His hand. Verse 41, Moved with compassion, stretched out His hand and touched Him and said, I am willing, be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. I like the way one of the other gospel writers said, immediately his skin became as a baby's. Soft, unmarked, perfect. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer your, for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony of them. Go do what the law says. 
<clears throat> the law said, by the way, in, in Leviticus chapter 14, the law said that he was to send a messenger to get a priest. He wasn't even allowed to go get the priest himself. And the priest would come outside the city where he was and would examine him. And if he was found to be clean, he was to bathe and put on new clothes and come and offer the sacrifice. It was two doves. The, the sacrifice for the cleansing of leprosy was to bring two doves. One dove was to be cut from the neck to the feet. And the water, uh, the blood dripped into pure water. And then they took the second bird and they tied him to a hyssop branch with a scarlet thread. And they dipped that bird into the bloody water and let it go free. Man, isn't that symbolic to what happens to us? when we give our life to Christ in baptism. Jesus gave His blood for us, and we come as lepers. And we are dipped in the blood of Jesus. And the scarlet thread of sin is broken, and we are set free. Mm. Don't tell anybody. And of course, what did He do? He told everybody. <laughs> you remember when you were a new Christian? I couldn't quit talking about it. Uh, people would ask me to hush, and I wouldn't. Uh, he went and told everyone. Had nothing, desperate, came to Jesus. Jesus saved him. Mm. Hallelujah. The second story is in Mark chapter 10. Ah, nope, sorry. John chapter 5. John chapter 5, Jesus goes to Jerusalem near, at the feast, and He goes uh, through the sheep gate to a pool called Bethesda. John chapter 5, it, uh, it had five porches. Verse 3, In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when, when the water stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before us. And Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well and took up his bed and walked. Here, here was a man who wasn't really looking for Jesus. Jesus just sort of walked in on his misery. He'd been sick for 38 years, and there was a, a belief that whenever the, the, the waters stirred in the pool of Bethesda, they, they believed it was an angel, and that whoever got in the water first would be made well. And so he laid by the well just hoping one of these days nobody would be paying attention and maybe he could roll over in there because he didn't have anybody to pick him up and put him in the water. And Jesus walks by uh, and says, Do you want to be made well? Well, you'd think that's kind of an obvious question. But you know what I've found out in 40 years of preaching? Not everybody wants to be made well. Not everybody wants it. They're not willing to, they're not willing to be well. Because to be made well means you now have to start living like somebody who's well. And as long as you're sick, you, you don't have that many responsibilities. You don't have to get a job. You, you don't have to be responsible. You don't have to be loving. You don't have to support a spouse. You don't have to take care of your children as long as you're sick. Do you want to get well? 
Do, do you want to be responsible? Do you want to live a godly life? Do, do you want to stop being unwell? Not everyone does. And this, this guy, like I said, he's not chasing Jesus down. Uh, he, Jesus just sort of stumbles on him. I, I got to tell you, I wasn't looking for Jesus when I was converted. I was pretty happy with uh, life. Some things weren't real exciting, but, you know, I, I, didn't realize, I didn't realize how lost I was. Uh, and Jesus sort of stumbled into my life. Uh, and at some point, the gospel touched my heart. And I realized I needed to get well. There were some things I need, that I was doing that I needed to stop doing. There were some values uh, that I held that needed to be let go. There were some behaviors that needed to be changed, and I wanted to get well. I wanted what well people had. I wanted what saved people had. Not lost people, not sick people, not addicted people. I wanted what Jesus people had. So I wanted to get well. You want to get well? There was no hocus pocus with Jesus, by the way. There's none of this angel stirring the water, people putting you in first. He just said, get up. <laughs> if you want to get well, I can take care of that for you. Get up and take up your bed and walk. And so he did. He got up and he took up his bed. Now there were some people watching who said, wait a minute, this is the Sabbath day. And they, they asked the man, why are you carrying your bed? It's a Sabbath day. And the Jews had a problem with doing any kind of work on the Sabbath day. The, the Mishnah records 39 different categories of work that are forbidden on the Sabbath day. They were strict about it. They didn't turn out their own lamps on the Sabbath day. They hired a Gentile to come in and put the candles out because that was work. The, the Mishnah says, if, if a house falls on your family on the Sabbath day, you should pray for a Gentile to come along and get them out. Because saving your family from a collapsed house is work, and you can't do that on the Sabbath day. He was a man who had been lame for 38 years. And Jesus said, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And so he picked up his bed and walked. There was, there was no hocus pocus. There was no trickery about it. And they said, why are you carrying your bed? Well, the guy who said, take up your bed and walk, uh, told me to. Uh, and the key to that was walk. He hadn't carried his bed in 38 years. And the guy who made me walk said, carry your bed, and I'm going to do what he said. I've been listening to you people for 38 years, and nobody did anything. And Jesus, he came to Jesus. Well, how much faith did he have? A mustard seed. You know, he, 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 didn't, he didn't even know for sure who he was. They asked him, who was he? I don't know. But I know this, I used to be laying on that bed, now I'm carrying it. Ah, hallelujah. The third story is in Mark chapter 10. The story of Bartimaeus. Mark chapter 10, verse 46. Now as they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho, his disciples and, and a great multitude with him, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they, they, they warned him, be quiet. And he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. He's over there begging, wearing the blind man's cloak. A blind man in the first century had a cloak that he wore. And he wore that so that people would know he was blind and wouldn't step on him or push him down. Or they might actually see him with his blind man's robe, and they might actually give him a coin or two. 
a, a gift to help take care of him. You know, there was, there was no social security in Israel in the first century. If you were blind, you, you had to beg to eat. How degrading that must have been. You can't work. It was physical work that people did. Farming, fishing, carpentry. Hmm. He hears Jesus is coming. And he, he has heard enough about Jesus, and he knows enough about Jesus to know Jesus can fix this. Son of David, have mercy on me. They tried to hush him. Hush. Be quiet. Don't cause a scene. He wasn't having any of it. <laughs> no, he just yelled louder. Have mercy on me! Jesus stopped. He stood still, verse 47, and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man to him, saying, Be of good cheer. Rise. He's calling you. And, verse 50, this is good, if you don't have this underlined, and throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. You know the significance of that? They said, all right, the master's going to see you. He took off his blind man's garment, threw it down, said, I won't be needing that anymore. Ain't going to be no more begging. Ain't going to be no more tripping and falling in the gutter. No more being run over by the chariots because I'm not going to be blind anymore in just a bit. Man, that's faith. He was willing to throw aside his security, his safety, his living. He was willing to throw it all aside because he knew that Jesus was going to take care of it, that he was going to make him see. And Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? That seems kind of like an obvious question too, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, I just threw the blind garment down, right? What, what do you want me to do for you? That is a significant question, though. When you came to Jesus, what did you want Jesus to do for you? I knew I needed to be saved. I was lost. I had sins that needed to be forgiven. I wanted Him to, to forgive me of my sins, to save me. I, I wanted Him to give me the family that I never had, a godly marriage, and children to raise up for His service. I wanted, I wanted Him to give me noble fellowship, to be around others who loved God uh, and who wanted to live for Him, serious believers in Jesus Christ. I wanted Him to make a difference. I didn't want to live that life that I saw all around me growing up. What, what do you want me to do for you? Fix me. <laughs> Save me. Teach me how to live and guide me in the path I ought to walk. What do you want me to do for you? Mm. The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus. Mm. Love that. I love the way so many people, because Jesus worked powerfully in their lives, they immediately committed themselves. And they said, He's the one. He's, he's the hope. He is the Son of God. He is Messiah. He's the one I want to follow. And they followed Him. Love that. Not everyone does. As much as I wanted what Jesus had for me, I was a slow learner. I, I, I had lots of doubts and lots of questions and uh, had to be convinced uh, from Scripture uh, what I needed to do and, and 
my wife and her family patiently taught me what it meant to be a follower of Jesus Christ until the time for the decision came. And you see, there, there comes a time in everyone's life when you have to make a decision. Do I really believe the gospel story? I mean, do I believe it enough that I'm willing to jump in with both feet? Do I believe it enough that I'm willing to leave the sickness behind? Do I believe it enough that I'm willing to throw the cloak of sinfulness down and walk a different path? Am I ready for Jesus to do what Jesus is going to do in my life? And a time for a decision came in my life. I confessed Him as Lord and was baptized into Christ. And many of you, most of you, in this room, did the same thing. We came to Jesus. Some of us knew exactly what we were doing and had it all worked out and we were ready. Some of us were kind of sure, but we didn't know exactly for sure. But we, we hoped and we believed and, and so we made the decision. And some of us, Jesus just sort of caught us by surprise. <laughs> But we were so touched, we made the decision. And it was the best thing we ever did. Amen, church. Best thing we ever did. My, my life has been so rich since I gave it to Jesus Christ. I wouldn't go back. I wouldn't go back. Not at all. Not, not for anything in this world would I go back. Hmm. How about you? This morning, there may be somebody that needs to come to Jesus. You may be here this morning, and, and He's been working on you. <laughs> and the Word's been touching you. And you need to make a decision. You need to say the words, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And having made that confession, you need to be buried with Him in baptism for the forgiveness of sins. This morning we're going to sing an invitation song. If you're there, when we sing the song, come down to the front. They'll ask you one question. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And if you say yes, we'll bury you with Jesus this morning. If you're a Christian, and long ago you made the decision, but for some reason uh, you got blown off course, Something happened in your life and you've been away. But you want to come home. You know where you belong. And you want to come home. We'll pray for you. Pray with you and for you. And, and restore you back into fellowship with Jesus Christ, according to the Scriptures. If you have need of the invitation this morning, we ask you to come forward while we stand and sing.
Come together this morning to recognize Christ as our Savior, something that He has commanded us to do whenever we come together and meet. We recognize in Christ for His body, for what He's done for us, for the life that He lived, and the cup, which represents the blood of Christ, which gives us the forgiveness of sin. If you'll pray with me right now. Our Heavenly Father, we are blessed as a people to be here. I ask, Father, that you will intercede for us with the Spirit, that each one of us will remember you for who you were. I ask, Father, that we'll do this in a way that's meaningful. We remember the body of Christ. We remember that sacrifice that he gave for us. We thank you, Father, that you've given us that sin, that, that son for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the same way, we're told to take the cup, the fruit of the vine, to remember the day that our Lord and Savior was hung on that cross. We ask, Father, that you do forgive us of our sins. We're so glad, Father, that we were born on this side of the cross that gives us that opportunity, the opportunity of forgiveness. Thank you for that death, the burial, and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for forgiveness of sins. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning. What a blessing it has been to be here today to to watch Gabriel put on his Lord in baptism. You know, God has blessed us so much. You just think back the last 24 hours how much God has blessed us. We've uh, been able to uh, have adequate shelter. We've been able to have all the food that we wanted. We've had clean water. And so many people don't have those blessings. Again, we've been able to watch Gabriel be baptized by his grandfather. And what a blessing that is for for him. We've been able to come together to worship our God in song and in prayer. And we've been able to meet with friends, people we've known for a lifetime, and a chance to meet others and develop new friends. God has been so good to us. We also realize, though, in in the midst of all this joy, there are some people that are, are suffering. Some people are anxious. There are people suffering with health problems, with uh, 
upcoming surgeries, surgeries they've just had, and we need to remember those. We also need to remember that in the midst of all this joy, some people are concerned about their jobs. Will I be able to keep my job? How will I be able to support my family and pay my bills? We need to remember these people. And there are also some that are lonely, those that have lost loved ones, people just wanting to be loved and trying to find a group of people that love them, and we need to remember them also. The Scripture tells us that God's love will never end, that nothing can come between us and the love of God. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Our most gracious Father, we thank you for loving us in so many ways and providing so much for us. We're thankful for your plan of salvation. We witnessed today in Gabriel's putting on of your son in baptism. Father, help us to always be mindful of other people, to those that are lonely, those that are, are looking for a place to, uh, to be a part of, for a family. Forgive us when we're too wrapped up in our own problems to look to other people. Be with their sick. Be with each one of them and bless them and just hold them in your hand. Help us, Father, that through our whole lives that we might live a life that would bring honor and glory to your name. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Love.